Welcome back to this week's episode of the WSBC Podcast. My name is Daniel Lewis, and I'm the worship leader here at Wakulla Springs Baptist Church. And we are joined by our pastor, Dr. Randy Creel. You want to go ahead and give us a recap of Sunday's message? Well, I don't feel the need to recap it that much. I'd just say it was the parable of the Good Samaritan. <laughs> That's a very familiar story. It's one of the two most famous parables that Jesus told the prodigal son, the good Samaritan. Most people of any level of biblical knowledge are familiar with those two parables. And so we'll just leave it at that. It's the good Samaritan. So the initial question asked by the lawyer that prompted the parable was, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if you ask someone at random, what the story was meant to teach, a lot of people might say it's about loving your neighbor. And it certainly is. Uh, But why did Jesus answer with this parable? Uh, This is where it's important that you read Scripture in context and you not just rip a verse from here and rip a verse from there. Um, Certainly the parable is about being a loving neighbor. And it's about compassion and the way we should live and the way we should treat people. That's all a part of this parable, showing mercy to people who are in need and who are hurting and broken. But there's a bigger picture to this parable, and it starts, as you started, with the question, uh, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So that's, that's what's on the table originally. A man asked Jesus, and not just any man, but a lawyer, a teacher of the law of Moses, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the, the text says he was doing this, he was testing him. So he's seeking to trap Jesus. Jesus responds with a question. Hey, what do you read in the law? What does the Old Testament say? How do you read it? And he answered. He, he answered actually with the, what Jesus identified as the two greatest commandments. Number one, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, all your mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. So he, he answered correctly. Those are the two things that God wants from us more than anything else in that sense. He wants us to love him with all of our being and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Those are commandments. And Jesus said that actually all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. So that in one sense, if you, if you obeyed those two commandments, if you did them perfectly, sinlessly, flawlessly all the time, your whole life, these other commandments down underneath them, you would be fulfilling those as well, at least the spirit of those commandments. And so that's the answer the guy gave. And and Jesus said, hey, that's the right answer. But the guy couldn't leave it there. Actually, that right answer should have caused him to look at himself and say, wait a minute. I don't always love God with all of my being, and I don't always love my neighbor as myself. Therefore, I have fallen short of what the law requires, and I'm a sinner. What do I do? I need mercy. I need grace. But he didn't do any of that. It's very similar, by the way, to another encounter that Jesus had with a rich young ruler, where he asked the same question, and um, Jesus listed off some commandments, and he said, well, I've done all of those since my youth. So Jesus picked the one that he struggled with the most, his love of money, went after that one, and the Bible says he went away um, sorrowful. He, he was not willing to try to engage with that commandment. And those commandments should have pointed to him that he was a sinner, but he was not willing to accept that. So this man, rather than being crushed by the weight of those two commandments and saying, I can't live up to that, instead, he wanted to narrow the scope. He just picked one of them the loving your neighbor part. And he said, uh, okay, who's my neighbor? So the only way he could justify himself, and the text does say he was wanting to justify himself. The only way he could do that is to narrow that scope because if you just leave it out there broadly, love God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself, there's nobody that lives up to that. No one. And that's what we strive for is what God works in our lives to bring us toward, but we, we fall short of that over and over again. Who's my neighbor? So if I could limit it and say, well, my neighbors are X, Y, and Z, then maybe, maybe I could show love to them in a way that might meet that standard, but not leaving it broad in general. So he asked, who's my neighbor? And that's why the story is told of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is answering uh, 
that question, who is my neighbor, with the bigger question on the table of what shall I do to inherit eternal life on the table as well. So how does Jesus define what a neighbor is? Well, it's interesting that he didn't. That's the question, right? Who's my neighbor? So Jesus, you think he's about to answer that question, and and in some sense he does, but not directly. He, He instead takes neighbor from a noun to a verb. So instead of, okay, I'm looking to identify who's my neighbor, name who that is, so I'll know what I have to do in relationship to them. And instead, at the end of the parable, Jesus said, which one of these three was neighbor to him? So who 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 acted like a neighbor to this man? Not The focus was not on the man, but on the person that came by, the good Samaritan. Yeah. And so the call then is not seek to identify who, whom do I have to love, but what kind of person am I going to be? Will I be a neighbor to those in need and show love? Will I be a loving neighbor as opposed to exclude certain people from this so I can know what yeah. I'm required to do? He's calling you to be neighboring. Yes, he's <laughs> opposed co- to only being a neighbor to those who have already <clears throat> been a neighbor to you. Because that'd yes. be a pretty close group. Correct. He's call he's calling on you to be a loving neighbor. Mm. And, and it's not defined by proximity as far as who lives next door. This guy was a stranger in the story. The Good Samaritan didn't know him, but he had compassion upon him because he's a person lying on the side of the road, half dead, and he needs help. If he doesn't get help, he's going to die. So that moved his heart, and he engaged, and he served as a loving neighbor to that person. And that's where Jesus said, go and do likewise. So the setting of the parable was the road to Jericho. And you described the road to Jericho Jericho as being isolated, desolate, and dangerous. And it was known that this place, that it was a place for thieves to hide out and stuff. So you also explained to us what a Levite was and what a Samaritan was. If these understandings were missed to someone reading this parable, there'd be a lot of weight missing from this parable. Jesus didn't go into detail about those things because they were understood at the time. If he was talking to the people that he was, he was talking to the person. He knew all these things and understood it. But there's a lot of times where I'm reading a passage of Scripture, not just parables, but I just go, I don't know what what this means at all. And it's because I'm not really understanding. It's just, just, I just read a sentence and it doesn't mean anything because there's no context behind it. So how important is it for us to understand the historical context surrounding Scripture? Well, it can be very important. Um, The Scriptures took place in a historical setting. They're not just loosely organized, random sayings of a teacher. They have a historical context. And that historical context is important to help us understand what was going on, how was this understood, Um, what are the issues involved in this particular passage of Scripture? Now, let's be careful. Um, If you read this parable, you might not get everything that was being said, but if you didn't know anything about the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and even if you didn't understand the Samaritan part, you could still get the meaning behind the parable. You would know it's about hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's right there. Who's my neighbor? I'm answering that question. Now go and be a neighbor. So you would have missed what they would have understood when he picked the Samaritan. That was like, it would take the air out of the room. It it might not do that for you if you didn't understand that historical context. But you could still, it wasn't be like you would be blind. Let's put it like this. It would be the difference between seeing something in black and white and seeing something in color. So those those details provide the color, they provide the context. Now, now to be fair, there's certain parts of Scripture that without that context, you, you would be lost as to what's being said. But for the most part, you might see it like in black and white. 
whereas the context provides color. Like, what was that road like? Well, that colors the 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 issue. Um, what about the Samaritans and the Jews and their relationship? That colors the issue as well. To know that they, there was such racial hatred between them, it, it, it adds weight to the fact that the priest passed by who was Jewish, the Levite passed by who was Jewish, the lawyer who asked the question was Jewish, and now Jesus paints the Samaritan, which was hated by the Jews, and by the way, who hated the Jews, the Samaritans did, as the hero in the story, as the one who demonstrates what God's law said. Um, that was shocking to the original hearers. Uh, not as much to us because we've heard it so much. But historical context is important and, and setting it as to when was this said, where was it said. On, on Wednesday nights back pre-COVID, we were looking at, uh, we went through the whole Old Testament book by book and just gave the context for each book of the Old Testament. Yeah. When was it? What was going on here? When when did this person live? And and we that context is helpful for us to understand and set the scripture in its right place. And we were starting that on the New Testament and COVID interrupted and hopefully soon we'll be able to return to that. So understanding this context, should should our pastors and leaders be our only source of information or uh, to learn about this context or how should we go about that? Well, the first stop is the Bible itself. You want to compare scripture with scripture. So a good cross-reference, something like the treasury of scripture knowledge. Um, it's not all-inclusive, but it, it, it cross-references certain things. So it might, it might, I didn't look it up, but it might, when you see Levite, it might take you back into the Old Testament and help you find passages that describe what a Levite was or what he did or his responsibilities were. Um, resources like that can be helpful. Obviously, your pastors, your leaders are going to be critical as they teach and preach, God has given us pastor teachers in order to equip us for the ministry. And so um, God uses them to help us better understand the Bible. And, and so that's, that's obviously a source of information. But there are tons of resources that, that you can have, you can, you can buy, you can find free online, some of them that will help you give a context to, um, to what's going on in a particular passage of Scripture. A good Bible commentary, a good Bible dictionary will help define some terms, and, and all of those are available either in, in a hardback book or um, electronically. And, and I say that, though, but also realize that not everybody in the world has those resources available. So can they not understand the Bible? Well, yes, they can. Again, go back to that black and white color illustration. So right up there, I'm looking up on my shelf and there's some pictures there of pastors in Haiti. So one of the things on mission trips that I do is um, I, I try to teach and help train uh, pastors in Haiti. I love those guys. They're on the front line, cutting edge, hard, foxhole type service. And they don't have all the resources. Like we're sitting in a room with, I don't know, about a thousand books and I remember teaching once, and, and one of the pastors that I love dearly, I was commenting that I had about a 1,000 books, and he said, I have one book, one. Well, the next year I took him a concordance, so now he at least has two. But the point is those resources aren't available to him. And so some of the things that we might have, they don't have, but they do have the Bible. And so the Bible is sufficient to stand alone, and yes, that context helps bring color to the passage helps us to understand what was being said, and that's very important. But also, again, you can read this passage without knowing that the road from Jerusalem to Jericho dropped 3,000 feet and it was yeah, 17 yeah. miles long and that thieves hung out there. I mean, that does add color and context, but you can still understand the point without that. A big theme from the story was compassion. The Samaritan showed great compassion for the man in the ditch, to some people, compassion comes a little more naturally, but for all Christians, it should be something we're able to express regularly. Now, if I'm not an inherently compassionate person, what are some ways I can challenge myself to become one? <clears throat> I think it is true 
that some people, as you phrased it, maybe are more compassionate than other people. Like, I'm not denying that they're sinful and they're fallen, but they seem to have more empathy for others than other people yeah, Without do. necessarily going out of their way to do so. Right. But we're, we're, as believers, we are called to be compassionate. Um, one of the other New Testament writers said, on some have compassion, making a difference. And he was using it in the context of evangelism. Um, compassion is is like Jesus. So when we have compassion, that's being like Jesus. Uh, he looked at the multitudes, he had compassion on them. He looked at the individual maybe and had compassion upon that person. So what can I do if I'm not, if I don't necessarily naturally think along those lines? Um, well, number one, immerse yourself in the scriptures because the Bible is what transforms us the Holy Spirit uses God's word to transform us into the image of Christ. So compassion in me is really the character of Christ being formed inside of me. So draw near to God, draw near to Jesus. Immerse yourself in his word and prayer. Submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. Remember the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Well, love would encompass, or include compassion. So that's that's a... That's a fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in us as we submit and yield ourselves to him. So I don't think we should look for this, just what's our natural inclination one way or the other. Not denying that some people do maybe trend more in that direction. I think of Barnabas in, in the book of Acts. He was... His name was not Barnabas. That was a nickname because they called him the son of encouragement. Mm. Well, they didn't call everybody the son of encouragement, but there was something about him. Mm. But everybody's responsible to encourage. So I think the same things here. We, we have a responsibility to show compassion. That's just showing the love of Jesus in a practical way. Um, it's not necessarily like a feeling, like a goosebump Valentine's Day kind of feeling. <laughs> Nothing wrong with those, but it, it's more than that. Because I think in the story, probably the Samaritan was pretty repulsed by what he saw. Yeah. Got a bloody man in the ditch. You don't know who else is around. You don't know what's about to happen. That's that's pretty repulsive, but yet his compassion motivated him to practically meet the man's need. So I think we should think about compassion in the sense of sharing the gospel with people. But sometimes what's called compassion ministries open those doors um, in, yeah. in showing people that we care and meeting their need in a practical way in the name of Christ. Just a quick story. Um, in Haiti, one year we went to a, a fishing village and actually ended up planting a church there. But the first day I started... We went there for three days, and I started in the book of Genesis and just gave kind of storied through the Bible to the cross and the resurrection. And we started with creation. So we went part way in the book of in, in, in the Old Testament on day one. People weren't necessarily listening. They were they were kind of talking and they just weren't necessarily engaged. They were there but they weren't necessarily engaged. My daughter and my son were working with the children just a few huts down from us. And through the translator, they asked the kids, the kids wouldn't engage. They wouldn't jump and play games or anything. What's wrong? Why won't you do this? And they're like, we're too hungry. We, we just, we're too hungry. We need. So the next day we came with baskets of bread that we bought. And um, we fed the kids, we fed the adults. I'm going to tell you something, that was a turning point. They started to listen. I think probably helped that they weren't as hungry. <laughs> it's a fishing village, but they weren't catching fish at that time. So they didn't have anything to eat, really. The, the fish had either moved out or fished out for a while. I don't know, but then they started listening. And then things began to change. Hmm. 
And 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 I th- I think God used that show of compassion of we care that you're hungry to to open their hearts mm. to the gospel message. Mm. And we were able to plant a church there and it's still there. We still go there. Yep. So at the end of the passage in verse 36 Jesus asks the lawyer which of these 3 do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So what was the lawyer's takeaway from this parable? Well, I'm not sure what the lawyer's takeaway from the parable was because we're not told. It just ends. But I would suppose that it's something <laughs> like the, the coyote's reaction when the roadrunner escapes. <laughs> Every time. And when he thinks he's got him, and this guy's like, okay, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Well, what do you think? Well, love God, love your neighbor. But who's my neighbor? I'm looking for a loophole. And Jesus just sewed that loophole up and turned it right back on the guy. Which one showed mercy? Which one was a neighbor? Well, the one that showed mercy, you go and do likewise. Stop looking for people that you can exclude from this, but... Look at yourself. You go and be a neighbor, a loving neighbor to people. So I, I think probably as often it was like, mm, like, <laughs> man, he, we didn't think of him answering like that. He got away again. We couldn't trap him. That's probably what the guy's reaction was. But what, what about us? What would our, should our takeaway be? Well, I think in the big picture, our takeaway should be that none of us love our neighbor like this all the time, which is would be the requirement of the law. There's not like, well, love your neighbor from from eight in the morning till noon. Yeah. Uh, no, it's an all the time as yourself and love God with all of your being. Those commandments are true commandments, and they're God's word, and we fall short of them. And and by the law comes the knowledge of sin. We should we should recognize. Lord, I don't do that. I, I don't I don't always respond like the Samaritan did to everybody in need that I see. And when I don't, I'm falling short of your standard of loving your neighbors, you love yourself. So God, I need your mercy. And I need you to change me and help me so that I more am a reflection of Christ. So that that's number one, the big picture. I, I can't be saved by my own self-efforts. Hmm. I cannot. I will fall short of God's standard. I will. I do. And so will everybody listening. We need God's mercy. But then the smaller picture is um, we, we are called to love our neighbor. And that means being a neighbor. So I'm responsible to show compassion to people in a practical way when I see their needs. So two things. Number one, if I know about their need, and number two, if I'm able to meet that need, then I have a responsibility to be a neighbor to that person. Jesus said, go and do likewise. And so instead of looking for loopholes and ways to excuse ourselves, we should look for opportunities to live in obedience to what God's word says. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the one that fell among thieves? The one that showed mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Mm. We would do well to heed those words. I think that's a good point to end. Uh, I meant to say this at the beginning, but this is our 50th podcast. Oh, really? The big 5-0. Interesting. But uh, they say... (laughs) They say you have it down at 100, so we're halfway there. Well, maybe we're halfway there. (laughs) I'm not sure if we'll ever get it down. Yeah. Um, But we do the best we can. But thank you guys for listening to this week's episode. You guys have a good week.